I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul, and I would like to share with you today a few thoughts on the letter to Titus. This important small epistle was written in the first century and reflects the nature of the church and its times. The author is unknown, but he writes in the name and spirit of Paul to one of Paul's closest companions, Titus. Titus is not mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, but he is mentioned in several other Pauline letters and delivered the letters to Corinth. So he was an important emissary for Paul. In this letter, he has been assigned to Crete to set up local churches there to appoint bishops and elders and deacons to guide the church on its great spiritual journey. And this letter gives him criterion to follow and use in choosing church leaders. This is always important in every era. The church has to prayerfully, soberly think about who is to lead the church in prayer, in social action, and in love. They should be people of the highest quality. In chapter 1, verse 5, Titus is informed about his mission. The reason I left you in Crete was to correct any shortcomings and to appoint elders in every city in accordance with the instructions I gave you. If the man is blameless, married once, and has children who are believers and are not accused of rebelliousness. For a bishop as God's steward must be above reproach, not arrogant, not quick-tempered, nor a drunkard, not a bully, and not greedy. Instead, he should be hospitable. He should love what is good, be prudent, upright, holy, and self-disciplined. He must adhere to the true word as it was taught, so he'll be able both to offer encouragement and sound teaching and to refute opponents. That is quite a list of things about an individual. These qualities are so important. When people encounter disciples of the Lord, they should see the Lord reflected in their life, in their actions, so that they could say God truly is alive and well and ruling in this church. If church leaders are greedy, arrogant, prone to temper tantrums, drunkards, manipulators of people. Well, people would say, this is an ungodly situation that I want to steer clear of. So Titus, as a vocation director and former of the early community in Crete, had a very awesome task to fulfill. And it remains an awesome task for church leaders today, how to choose those who will lovingly lead the people of God. There wouldn't be anti-clericalism in the world if there wasn't clericalism. And clericalism springs from all those who use positions in the church to fulfill their own egos and their own needs at the expense of others. Now, the faithful as a whole are given admonishments as well on how to live sober, decent, loving lives with families filled with tranquility and mutual respect and reverence for one another. He reminds 
Titus that all of us, without being touched by the grace of God, are filled with a godless desires and tendencies. In chapter 3, verse 3 and following, he has this very important line. We too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various desires and passions, spending our lives in malice and envy. We were hateful and we hated one another. That describes the life outside the power of the grace of God. People who deceive themselves first and then deceives others. People who may appear arrogant and proud of themselves, but inside hate themselves. They may put on the appearance of caring about others but really hold others in contempt. But by the grace of God, that all changes. By the grace of God, we're able to have graceful lives, to live graciously, whether we're impoverished materially or not. We can be wealthy in the things of the Lord. And he follows that passage up with a beautiful hymn and poem in chapter 3, verse 4 and following. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, not because of righteous acts we had performed, but through his mercy, he saved us through the bath of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit which he poured out upon us so richly through our Savior Jesus Christ, so that we might be restored to fellowship with God and by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. This beautiful hymn of being filled with the Spirit of God, of having our lives turned around of transforming our actions from foolishness to true wisdom. Each of us can give thanks to God for our faith and for the faith as it develops in our lives. This faith has to be vibrant, growing, and changing for the better. It can't be stagnant. We can't rely on what has gone before, but look forward to what is to come. Our teachings that we follow and share with others have to be authentic. We can't dismiss the wisdom of 2,000 years, but embrace it and make it our own. We know that so often people say, I know the church teaches A, B, or C, but I'm smarter than that. I'm 25 years old. I know what life is about. That is so naive and so dangerous. We should take advantage of the wisdom of 2,000 years, the wisdom that's been lived by billions of people. We should learn from the mistakes of the past, which are so numerous, and also draw upon the virtue that is a part and parcel of the faith life. So that we can find not only a modicum of happiness in this world, but actual joy and fulfillment according to God's plan for us. We should support those who are supporting us, the bishops, the deacons, the leaders in the church, but every person has to be a leader of love and an enemy of hate. That's my prayer for you, the viewer.